see the world through other people's eyes. Now, empathy is a quality of character that can change the world. Hi, it's Edwin Rutch, and this is Dialogues on How to Build a Culture of Empathy. And I'm here with Lisbeth Halter Brudal, and we already had a a uh, interview with her. And what we want to do in this in this uh, video is to go through her uh, program, which is uh, about is called Empathic Communication. And Lisbeth is a psychologist living in Oslo, and she's written many books. And she's also created a 20-hour empathy uh, communication uh, training for uh, professionals and healthcare workers and educators. And she's also created a 40-hour training for uh, for uh, for training trainers of this process, yes. right? So, yeah. So, thank you uh, for being here, and uh, perhaps you'd like to add something to to that introduction. No, that's right, and it's my pleasure to be here. I want to tell you, I listened to the dialogue you had with Art Markman the, uh, three weeks ago, and I found it very interesting. And the two things they said, which is uh, we can connect to what I'm going to tell you today. Uh, he said, learning by doing. Mm. It's very important. And the ex what makes you happy, that's experiences. Not a new car, a new house, <laughs> I don't know, more money, but experiences. So this training program is really learning by doing, and it's also the kind of experiences with you. I suggest that I start with telling you something of the background of the, of the method, and then we go into it step by step. Is that okay? That sounds great. So, uh, if you came to me and said you wanted to be a part of a, of a, of a course, the first thing I would say to you is I will show you this. Can you see it? Uh, if you can raise it up a little bit. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, here we say that people in crisis, yes, uh -huh. uh, is what we call in the frontier zone. They leave their everyday consciousness. And when they do that, what is, in, is uh, influenced then is their affect, cognition, uh, cognition as I said, perception, body reaction and consciousness. And how do we communicate with people who are in a frontier zone? Because they are very sensitive Give me an ex uh, we can take an example. Uh, women has not got uh, newly got a um, diagnosis of cancer. She's in shock. And how do we communicate with her? In this sensitive period, the possibility is that she withdraw, that she deny, and the other possibility is that we invite her to uh, empathic communication. Because we know that what we say and what we do not say <clears throat> in this connection is of very importance. And it's also, to be sensitive, is also a kind of resource. So we start with uh, this um, um, explanation of how, how the patients may be, where, what where the patients you meet might be in a kind of state in a frontier zone. Uh, so this is, uh, if it, there's a doctor who's, and they have a patient, and they've just told this patient that they have cancer, the patient is kind of in shock and, and kind of pulling into themselves, and, and you're yeah. wanting to kind of connect with them and establish more of a empathic connection. Is that right? Yes. Because we know, my experience is that sometimes when you say the right thing in the right moment, you may give them an experience of being, uh, they've been seen. On the other side, if you say the wrong thing in that moment, you may hurt them and give them a new kind of shock, a new trauma. So my intention is to 
uh, educate professionals, uh, doctors, nurses, psychologists, um, uh, and uh, and the teachers to see the right, say the right thing in the right moment, mm. and not to forget to understand the sensitivity of the person. Okay. Yeah. So the basis for this method is that research suggests that the capacity to uh, be empathic is um, inborn. And we have then uh, the my program is based on the dissertation by a Norwegian psychologist. And dissertation heads was training of empathic communication for helping professionals. That was two thousand in year two thousand. It was very convincing that he found that through this program he chose the professional might be learned, might be trained in empathic communication. And uh, after 18 months follow-up, uh, they maintained the, uh, the capacity and it slowly increased after 18 months. So this is what I, is, uh, my, uh, my method is building upon. Oh, okay. this. Oh. Yeah. My experience uh, is when I developed this method in 2004, and if I look through the last three years, we are a team working with this method now, and we have tried to, since we talked together, <laughs> mm -hmm. we try to find out how much has this explored during, th during the last three years. And we found that hundreds of people uh, during these years have got in contact with empathic communication in some way or other. By lecture, by courses, uh, by, um, uh, by reading my books and see the films I made, and through media. The evaluation follow-ups we have done is clearly also, also the same as Per Nedrum found, that it has a lasting effect when you first have learned it. I'll give an example of how, how I work. One and a half year ago, I, got, uh, I was contacted by a um, centre far away in another city of Norway, which where 250 persons wanted to learn empathic communication. 250? Yeah. Oh, wow. And they had very different uh, jobs. They were nurses, doctors, psychologists, and etc. And I said, I can educate you a core of person in the center. And these, when these have been educated, they can go back to the rest and educate them, and so we did. They came to me uh, for 40 hours course, and I visited them once, and when I had the follow-up now, after one and a half year, they are very content with the method. The four, more or less 250 persons are still using it in their work, and it says this, I think it's very impressive, they said it's, it gives us a feeling of we have the same value. Perhaps it's too much to say <laughs> that we have developed a culture of empathy, <laughs> but we know that we have touched something very important. And, so and this how is, many uh, trainers do you have now? There's, uh, I mean, overall. In, uh -huh. of, of this 250, it was seven trainers going back. And I used the same model in the hospital in uh, near Oslo, where there were many wards in the hospital who wanted to learn it. So I developed, I uh, educated 52 core persons who went back to the hospital and trained the others. Did you say 52? Yeah. Wow. Okay. That's a lot. Yeah. 
so that was in a part parted in five uh, sessions so this is a way of 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 um, uh of how to develop the method so that many people can learn it so i you see hmm? so if i should conclude on this point the evaluation use is a useful the evaluation shows us that this is a useful method People say they have a tool. Uh, it prevents burnout symptoms. It does not take more time. It, uh, we get a positive feedback from the clients. It's in. It's inexpensive. And you uh, doesn't take more time. Uh, and it influences the workplace. And of course, the most important thing is that the patients give them the positive reactions. Be very content, feeling of being confirmed and understood. Okay, so you've got you've had really good uh, feedback from the patients. They've they said that they feel heard and they feel better after. Uh, this uh, empathic communication process and it's lowering costs, it's easy to implement um, and so it sounds like uh, like it and have you done studies? Have there been like uh, evaluation studies uh, on the effectiveness as well? We have a lot of evaluation um, results mm -hmm. but we have not yet uh, tried to write it out but the, what is f seems very clear is that <laughs> it is still there after a, a period which is very important I think it's not just that but it is the thing you learn for a moment and you forget it it seems as if it really is getting a part of their way, way of working but what you mentioned is very important and we high hope it will be possible for us to gather all these evaluation operation results we have and make a um, uh, uh, report on it. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you, you have it in the hospitals now and it's uh, continuing to expand in the hospitals, it sounds like. Uh, and then there was this community that you implemented it in the community and had seven trainers. What was that community again? The first I mentioned? Yes. Oh, it's either I can't find the, the right English name for it. It's Virksomhet, we call it in English, in Norwegian. Uh, it's a new kind of um, organizing the health system in Norway. Oh, okay. Where, where they try to put together different uh, people working with school, with, with delivery, with um, uh, the, the doctors, so that they they in, they um, represent a kind of a community in different parts of what people need. Oh, I see. So it's like oh. an integrated medicine yeah. uh, approach, yeah. and it has yeah. the medical, the education, maybe in in one service. Then and then they also have the people trained in empathic communication as well when they deal with the. The, the clients or the people that come yeah. to take the services. Yeah, uh -huh. and what they say, in, this is in, in a town called Stavanger, <laughs> what they say is it's really, it's a, it gives a meaning to us that we all have the same kind of language. So when the patient comes to the doctor or when they come to the nurse, they were met by the same kind of communication. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so the training program is um, more or less the same content for a 20 hours course and a 40 hour courses. Except as you said, the 40 hour courses, you also learn how to learn mm -hmm. others. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Teach others. Uh -huh. Yes. Yeah. So the 
what is important in the training program is first of all, as I told you, that the who came to us learn about this. They learn how it is to be in a mm, frontier zone, and they learn the by psychology, the psychological theories, what is expected of a person who is in this kind of state, needing help. Okay, so you have an everyday state, is which is how people are in every day, kind of in their relationships. And then a frontier state is kind of like a stressed, being in a kind of a stressed and, or maybe suffering or in yeah. fear or maybe loneliness or some kind of a state like that? Yeah. And to understand that, we are lecturing about uh, three main theories. Self theory, developmental psychology, positive psychology. What and was the first one? I'm sorry, I didn't catch the first one. Self, self psychology. Oh, self psychology, okay. Yeah. Um, but the superior theory is the existentialistic theory, which means that we try to make it understandable how important it is that we as a helpers are become visible and we step forward in the dialogue with the patient. And we encourage the trainees to do this to become visible and step forward. I'll come back to that. Okay. So it's four theories. Hmm? So the training is then to train on the method in groups and in between the sessions. And when they come to the sessions, they bring with them the log. Uh, um, Anne Guru will tell you about this more because she has uh, made expenses of it. And the bring back the log to the group and we discuss the log, the experience they had. It is all about t learning by doing. Now, what is the log? I'm a little unclear about that. The log is that they should try out the method during the, during the method in between the sessions toward a friend, a hmm. husband, <laughs> a colleague, a patient, whatever. You just have to train it and bring it back so we can discuss it. Oh, okay. And that's, and that's my problem. That's the main thing. When you bring this back to the session, then we have our theories and we connect the experience to the theories we have all the time. So it's understandable what is going on. And in, in the addition to this, we have cases which we are training in groups, training and training in groups on the cases. So you have, uh, uh, during the, the uh, course, then uh, people go home and then they try it out and they're trying it out, they're, this method, empathic communication, they have a notebook and they're keeping notes mm -hmm. on, on, their, uh, on their experiences and then they come back and then in a group setting, they share their experience, they get kind of feedback, and then the feedback is also connected to the theory of, of, of how the whole process works. That's right. Okay. That's right. And the, the same thing we are doing with the cases we have in a session. So we work in group with cases, and we have the logs we bring between the sessions. Hmm? hard work <laughs> yeah well it's good it's good work it's important work <laughs> you know my opinion is that empathy is a sleeping capacity and I'm sure it's possible to awaken it so one part of the training is that I have in group and I said no we shall all together find out all the moments we wanted to give another person empathy, to express our empathy, and we didn't do it. And it's one of the most interesting things we discovered in this course is how many, yes, I remember, I should have done it. Why didn't you do it? 
Why didn't you take the call? Why didn't you say that you... No. They didn't have the courage. They had not had the courage to become visible. They had not had courage to step forward. Oh. I'm wondering if, if that is like we would call that presence in in uh, presence is when you are present with someone and I think that's maybe the the term of when you come forward it means that you're there with them yes. and and you're not closed you're not withdrawn you're you're really present and that takes sometimes that takes courage because we don't know what what to do like what should I do I don't know what to do and and so there's maybe problem. Yeah. There's, there's some kind of fear in being present, and being yeah. coming forward and being seen, and and you can train on it. It's a part of the training. It is exactly that. And my experience is that when we as helpers are present and invite the patient to be the same. We are a model of being present. Mm -hmm. And we invite them to hmm, become visible themselves. So, um, their, their method consists of four steps. And it is a process between two persons and the definition of empathy in this connection is the well-known <laughs> standing in someone else's shoes hmm? and we may say that the aim is to try to know another person's internal state and life and to establish his everyday power can you see it? Yes. Mm -hmm. State. Mm -hmm. Bring him back to the psychological balance and his everyday state. And we do this by. For, did you got my uh, um, e post the other day about the method? Um, you mean the steps? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. I mean, I, I was going to show the. Uh, um, the four steps here, just the over the narrative, affect, consciousness, reflections, meaning, and co-creator. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. So, the, the first step, we are in the other person's shoes. We try and we invite him or her to give her version of her situation, to tell us what she thinks was happening, uh, what uh, is her version of the problem and not to tell us what she has heard but his or her own opinion that is what we call we want the narrative and this so is oh and this is the story of we're using the example of a, a patient who is with the doctor who has just heard that she's has cancer and then is that the is that the story you want to build on? Yeah. Yes, okay. that's a good story. Yeah, and we want her version, uh, her narrative, as we say. So it's a narratology in a way. Hmm? And the second step, we are still in the other person's uh, shoes, and now the point is to hear her feelings about having this diagnosis. And by inviting her in an empathic atmosphere, we hope it's possible for her to say exactly what she's feeling, not what she thinks she should feel. And not, not what she has learned you should feel in such a situation, but what it is to her. And when we uh, are together in this atmosphere of her, her telling us her affection, we the main uh, aim is to develop her effect consciousness. Hmm? Okay. The third step is still we are 
in the other one's shoes, asking for her reflections about what has happened to her. And it's very important now to consider what kind of meaning this whole situation has to her. And not very, I, I have been giving courses for nurses working with uh, cancer patients, and at this point, very often, when the atmosphere is good, the patient might uh, tell us, have the courage to tell us they think they were dying, they were going to die. And this is of very importance for the patient and for us to know this fear of death. So then we have listened to the narrative, to the feeling and to the reflection. And now the whole process is changing. And now we are getting back to our own shoes. And we ask the patient if she would like to hear our opinion about what she's told her, about her story and reflections. And during the first three steps, it's important that we do not correct, we do not interrupt, we do not comment what she's saying. We are sitting there in a kind of mindfulness, listening to her uh, and having her give her the feeling that she is allowed to come forward. So you, now, you're not asking questions or do you, you just say, which? How do you kind of start the dialogue then? You say, just share, would you like to share your story of, of how you're feeling or how do you kind of sometimes, engage? Sometimes, sometimes we do it like this. We say that here in our world, we, we are first of all interested in your life and in you as a patient. So we will start with to listen to you. And then afterwards, we can have a dialogue. To, to mm, make it clear the roles we have. She's the main person. So to answer your question, no, we do not interrupt. We don't try to explain anything. We're just listening, receiving. But when the now uh, on the fourth step, the whole thing is changed. And we ask if the patient would like to hear our opinion. And then we use our competence, what we know about what she has told us. And then we have the possibility of correcting what she's saying, perhaps, about the, her fear of death, the possibility of dying in one week, one year, etc. And in this, uh, in this dialogue, in this being present together, we sometimes experience um, a moment of meeting, which is of very importance for the patient. And some of them say, ah, oh, no, I understand something, no, I have changed. And we have changed my situation, and perhaps we hope we're helping her back to her everyday state. Mm hmm? Mm hmm. So, um, we feel <laughs> the, who, we are who are giving the courses and who are our patients feel that it is sometimes and really a meeting between two persons. I must say that the training program then is to train on these four steps. In during the course, in the cases we have, in there when you do the log outside the course, and if you want to be a trainer, you're supposed to to write an essay as a kind of exam, and then we really can realize how much you're catched of the method. Yeah, do you have any questions? 
Um, so far, it seems it seems very clear. Uh, did you want to uh, kind of go into more of the step by step process within each of those, or how would you, were you thinking of exploring this topic? No, I think you know we we plan perhaps we should demo make a demonstration of the mm -hmm. method. Mm -hmm. it, I think that would be much better. Okay. If if it's possible to arrange it, we will see. Um, <clears throat> we um, know the um, my experience is that perhaps one um, one uh, kind of uh, uh, how should I say it uh, patients who need and really can use this kind of empathic meeting is um, the uh, working at the birth clinic. I have had many courses for midwives and it seems very very interesting to see what it may be of possibility to help uh, parents just after the delivery which they, many of them are in kind of shock, really, and uh, from their own. How helpful it is for them to have empathic communication before they're leaving the hospital. Mm. They have so many questions they have want to ask, and when we get the story, we have the narrative, we realize that sometimes it's not very correct, the story they have. And so we catch them before they leave the hospital. And the other thing is that they say, we can't remember what happened between 2 o'clock and 4 o'clock. I don't remember. And then we can fill it out so that they have a whole narrative when they leave the hospital. No well, well I know that that's very important because I had a, uh, you know, a sister-in-law who kind of went into postpartum depression after birth. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it was, it, was, it was very serious and it was, I think it was that sense of alienation is, is part of it, kind of being on your own and, and uh, feeling alienated and I think having that uh, sense of connection with others would have been a big help. It's been a big help, so help, so in... In, especially in one hospital, they now have this as, as a routine uh, that they talk with both both the mother and the father about their birth experience. And they're working through perhaps two or three uh, times before they leave the hospital mm. to clear out what was going on. And the story is that one woman who had this had this empathic com uh, communication after two days after she left the hospital she called up and said may i come back to you i want such an empathic communication once more nobody's <laughs> ever talked to me like that <laughs> i think it's a, a sweet story well that, yeah. that speaks to the larger uh vision of a culture of empathy um in that you're you're Having uh, kind of uh, developing this process where people can be heard in kind of high stress situations, and then what about uh, kind of everyday conversations uh, where you're you're kind of saying this natural state is that we're in, but I mean we have situations where people are in a natural so-called natural state of of being which is very highly stressed uh, naturally. Yeah. So and and we see that here in the especially in the poor areas in you know in the United States where people are stressed financially they're they're stressed uh, economically they're living in high stress uh, you know crime ridden violent uh, areas so there's a lot of stress and and it's really how do we uh, kind of bring that empathic presence and consciousness to you know why a wide variety, I mean, to, to everybody, you know. Um, it's, a, I think it's a question of uh, information, in a way. 
Um, I've been in um, this method has been demonstrated in the uh, in television, but it's um, I think it's important thing you 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 to say that because of it's not a, always a question of a crisis or patient. It's also you can use it friends among friends. If you have a friend who is in trouble, you may use this way of communicating, listening, listening. And then after you think you have heard enough, you ask if you want to hear my opinion. And <laughs> the story was, uh, I had a group of nurses and um, in the course, and she came back in the third session and said, well, I try this method at home. And then my daughter said, no, mother, what kind of courses are we in now? <laughs> <laughs> so she, missed, she, she overdid it. <laughs> but... The same woman said, yes, I can use it to work my young son. And when I did it, and afterwards I said, from now on, I want you to be my my my, uh, my person I can talk to. Mm. It gave me confidence. But I think, to go back to your question, my hope is that this might be a way of being together when we talk to each other. And understand, learn to listen, and then wait until the other person may listen to you. And what they say now is the um, uh, the the, uh, the health professionals is now we have a tool. Mm. We know it's right what you say, but now we have a tool <clears throat> to do it. Mm? Uh, so it's a it's more, it's a structured uh, theory and framework that can be applied. And so it kind of gives you a sense of clarity, and and the, and so we've kind of gone into the structure of it, and it's really kind of the next stage. Sounds like it's really the experiencing of it. You have to really go through and do it, and try it, and and then kind of experience what it's like uh, yeah. to do it. That's right. Yeah. The other <clears throat> experience I have is that working with cancer patients is very. Uh, something very sometimes very difficult for the nurses and doctors. And um, after I gave courses in the cancer hospital, many of them said that this is very practical way of working. So that's the other group I think is for the cancer patient. It's um, maybe used for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as well as uh, end of life care too. There's uh, people who are kind of at the end of their life, and we we yeah. have here the hospice, uh, yeah. you know, which which is uh, you know for people in that situation. And I've I, I interviewed someone once, uh, and her brother was dying, and he had a you know brain cancer, and then she she had been estranged from him. And then she she came to uh, you know to say goodbye. She thought she was going to help and all this kind of stuff. And he was already too far gone. And what she found is she had to kind of give up her control and just kind of be present with you know her her sister in law and her father. And and it was just so meaningful for her to kind of give up the control and just to have that sense of presence to be there with with them. Mm. Mm. Hmm. Yes, and the, the empathic communication is also of relevance for working with relatives to the patients. And I say that the four step is a very important one as a kind of a creative process. That's why I call it, we are co-creators. We create a new story together with the patient. And in that uh, new story, is that actually taking some kind of action, actually doing something together? Or how do you mean uh, creating a new story? I mean, uh, creating a, a kind of new internal landscape. Mm, okay. Uh, the patient who got the cancer diagnosed, she was, <clears throat> so, she was so scared. 
But when I come back to her, after listening to her, I come back to her with my competence, what I know, what I have heard. I can give her a new kind of uh, inner landscape. And it's, it's given, it, it's, we are creating this new together. So I say, what do you think of what I'm saying? And she said, yes, but. And so sometimes we go further on. So the, the creative process is very important uh, in uh, this dialogue. Yeah, so the first part, uh, she's just really heard, so she feels a sense of uh, connection and, and companionship. And as we uh, have that sense of connection, our oxytocin level goes up. <laughs> yeah. and, and that oxytocin is, uh, you know, a calming effect. So if we're in high stress, and fear about, you know, having cancer, you know, our cortisol, you know, looking at it from a chemical point of view, our cortisol is high and our body is full of this, you know, stress chemical. And the dialogue, the being heard, the feeling someone's presence, then starting to engage with them, kind of calm, calm, creates a sense of calmness and, a, and kind of a new state how gets created. Yeah. And uh, sometimes it's really a moment of meeting. Real connection then, kind of between two people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so perhaps I should say two words about the next uh, autumn. The, uh, then I'll have a new course uh, for a um, special group into from uh, leaders in international churches of Christ. And there will be a priest together with us. And this is a, a course, 40 hour course. And then I'll uh, invite you to a big conference north of Norway with 250 uh, delegates working with families and children. And they want me to give a lecture on empathic communication. So I hope and find interest in this group. And then in a hospital in the west of Norway, I have one day course for uh, a hospital uh, attendance and uh, perhaps we will go on with a further course. So it is still <laughs> work, uh, how should I say, it's uh, developing all the time. So you're, are you still refining the process then? Um, because there's many different curriculum out there and what I'm really looking at is how do we start combining them and kind of make them available online too. You have an online version, I, I believe, some videos, but they're in Norwegian. Is that right? Norwegian, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I described this in two of my uh, books. Yes. I don't know if there's something more we should uh, develop and talk about. Um. Yeah, maybe any kind of problems. Do you see any problems or, or obstacles, not really problems, but obstacles in, in this process? You know, what are the uh, uh, kind of the difficulties in that you need to overcome for this process? No, not no. for the moment. Oh, no. okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Okay, so thank you. Then, so, um, and then the... Uh, so we're, we're completed just giving the overview then of, of your process. <coughs> Pardon? It's, this is where we, we're, we have completed the overview and the outline yeah. of your process. So, yes. Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. And uh, we are a team working with empathic communication. And I know you will talk now with Anne Gru mm -hmm. okay. and later on okay. with uh, Petura and then with uh, Ronnie. Yeah, to get their experience with the process. That's it. Uh, and maybe sometime we can also do uh, do a dialogue, a little bit of dialoguing, see how yeah. it actually looks. So we're open for that too. That sounds like where the real action happens, where the action yeah. happens. Action. <laughs> thank you. Okay. okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Then I give the word to Anigu. Okay, great. Mm -hmm see the world through other people's eyes. Now, empathy is a quality of character that can change the world.